Okay. I'm a, the uh, other thing I'm going to cover tonight is, is value. Now, there's two ways you can get form on a, a two-dimensional piece of paper. And one is with value, which is light and dark. And the other is, is with edges, which we're going to talk about next week. And this is how you create the illusion of depth. Um, I'm going to draw, to give you some idea what I'm talking about with value, uh, typically what we've been doing uh, when I've been lighting the model is I've been lighting the model with a single light source uh, from, from the left and from above. The idea of the single light source is that the value pattern with a single light source will give me more dimensionality than if I used multiple light sources or if I lit the model from the back or, or from the front. Uh, both of those conditions uh, or multiple light sources would tend to flatten the, flatten the model uh, in terms of the value pattern would be less pronounced. Okay, so what do I mean by value? Value is basically uh, light and dark. And in, in drawings, uh, you can use anywhere from three to five or six values, and I'll show you an example of that shortly, to 25 or 30 or even more. Um, most of the value changes occur in the light. You, you have fewer, fewer value changes in the dark. Uh, but you can actually build it up to any level of finish, you want, uh, finish that you want. And I'm going to show you an example of a painting shortly where you can actually have a continuous value change by, by mixing one color into the other and, and slowly blending. Okay, so uh, typically with value we go from essentially black to white. And so our darkest value would be the black. Uh, the middle value would be a a mid-tone gray, and then on the other end of the value scale, we have a white. And we could have everything in between, so I could have another value that's not quite, that's somewhere in between these two, and I could have something here that's somewhere <coughs> in between uh, pure white and the mid-tone. Okay, so now for the figure, the easiest, let me give you a, an example, Not I've drawn this thing about a million times. Suppose we have a ball on a plane. And you can see why I'm doing a ball in a second. And again, our lighting is from the left and from above. And I could have easily had it from the right and from above. I usually always set things up from the left and from above because I'm right-handed. Now, I'm assuming there's some psychological reason for that, but that's, that's pretty standard. Most uh, drawing groups you'd go to, the lighting is going to be above, uh, from the left and from above. Now, as this is a curved surface, this is a ball. Well, I think I know the reason for that. What's that? I think I see the reason for that. What is it? Well, because you're right-handed, all of the shading will be done on the right side of the drawing, so you won't be reaching your hand over your drawing to do your shading. Yeah, that's probably right. I agree with that. Because I, I've done it unconsciously for years without even knowing why I did it. So, and I usually, when I'd like things, even in painting, when I would like the, the objects from the right, I, would, I would never would like that. For some reason, I'd always move it to the left. That's because you always have to reach it over. It would be interesting to look at the artists who painted from the other direction when the lights come from the right, see if they were left-handed. I've heard that left, lefties do light it from the right side. I, that's ex so it's the exact opposite of what I do, but I've heard that. Although I've never been to a drawing group uh, where they intentionally lit it from the right side because everybody in the group was left-handed. Usually, because most of the people are right-handed, they, right, they light it from the left side. But that's, that's a good point. Okay, so I've essentially drawn like a, the equator for the ball. I'm showing you, I'm actually looking through seeing the back edge. The point is the important curvature is essentially uh, the middle of, of this equator. And once I, I start turning away from the light, this whole area is in shadow, okay? So this would be the dark side of the ball, okay, and this would be the light side. Now I can break this down further. So directly where, the, where this light beam is hitting, I'd have a highlight area. So that I could have a highlight, and then you could actually uh, have some, some bands where it would gradually get a little bit darker as I moved away from the lightest light, which would be the highlight. When I hit this equator region, where I actually start turning away from the light, I get what's known as the coarse shadow. Uh, the coarse shadow is also called the turning edge. I've also heard it called the bedbug line. Okay, why is it called the bedbug line? Well, 
in the 19th century, the French students at the French academies lived in hovels, and when they'd come home and flip the light on, the bed bugs would all go for the line where the shadow was on the floor. And I kind of like bed bug line, but we'll call it the core, the core shadow of the turning edge, just to uh, be artsy. Anyway, the other thing that you'd have uh, for this, this uh, setup, if you'd have a cast shadow from the ball onto the table, and the cast shadow actually ends up being the darkest dark in this drawing. And it's actually the darkest right under the ball where all the light is being blocked. It gets a little bit lighter, and the edges are very sharp initially, and they sort of fuzz out as you get away from the, from the, from the ball. Now, again, as I turn away from the light, you'd expect the shadow to get darker, but actually it doesn't. So this would be my, this would be my darkest dark. If I let my dark equal number one, this would be a one. And my core shadow might be a number three, which means it would be out here someplace. Now why, so that this would be the darkest dark, the core shadow, uh, the cast shadow. Okay. And my next darkest dark would be the core shadow. And even as I turn away, you, you would expect it to actually get darker, but it doesn't. Why is that? What happens is I get reflected light coming up from the table. Basically, so I'm getting secondary light being thrown back into the shadow part of the ball, and I get what, what's known as a reflected light shadow. Okay, <clears throat> so essentially with these five or six value changes, I can essentially model anything, right? I have the cast shadow, I have the core shadow, I have uh, the reflected light, and I have the highlight. And anything in between would give me, I could actually either uh, put a few more bands of, uh, uh, of shading in between, but I would, particularly anything in the light would never be as uh, dark as anything in the dark. So the reflected light shadow could never be as light as anything uh, in the light, even close to the, where I have the turning edge or the core shadow. Um, and that's another common mistake that a lot of artists and beginners make. They'll actually think that because of the contrast between the very dark dark of the cast shadow and the core shadow, uh, it's, they will actually think that the reflected light shadow is lighter than uh, the mid-tone area in the light near the, near the uh, turning edge. And that's not true. Okay. Now I could actually make this a continuous modeling where I could actually just keep adding values and values where I go from essentially uh, a number number 10 of the lightest light, which would be a white, where the highlight is, to essentially the core shadow, which is number one, which would be the darkest dark. And I can actually, you know, vary this continuously. It's much easier to do with paint, but you can actually do it with charcoal or pencil, too. Now, in most drawings, we have a limited amount of time. You, you know, you can, you can actually have a very effective drawing, and that's what this is. This has about, essentially, between about five and six values. I use tone paper to give me uh, the mid values. Mostly the mid values in the white. You can see the white chalk is where the highlights are. And then you can see all the, all the basic, the, the value changes I talked about. Uh, if you look at the breast, you can actually see the turning edge shadow on the breast. Then you can see the reflected light shadow as right, right as almost breast, as the breast touches the, uh, the chest wall. And then you can actually see the cast shadows from the breasts uh, on the rib cage. Same thing with the face, okay? You can actually see the cast shadow from the nose on the left side of the face, and the cast shadow from the chin and the, uh, and the neck the, uh, on the left side of the neck. And you can actually see, again, on the legs, you can see the coarse shadow and some of the re reflected light shadow on the other side. But this is a very, this drawing was done in 45 minutes, and I have, I've used a very limited value range uh, because of the time limit, but I can all get a very effective drawing because I can lump a lot of the values, uh, the mid values in the light in, with the tone paper. I lump them in uh, by using the tone paper. And that saves me a huge amount of time and a large number of steps. So this model posed for 45 minutes. The first 20 minutes, I essentially uh, sketched in uh, all the action lines and the edges. Uh, and the features uh, characterize the model. So even if she moved after the, the, she took the break in the second 20 minutes, uh, essentially I didn't change anything. I just basically worked on the value pattern and some of the edges. And I'll talk about the edges next week. 
I mean, the way you create dimensionality, this, this figure has dimensionality in this two-dimensional piece of paper, is with the values and also with edges, which we'll talk about next week. You can actually see my edges are varying all over the place, where I have a hard edge here, uh, I have soft edges, and essentially those are also helping me give you the, the uh, illusion of dimensionality. Okay, let me take it a step further with my other visual prop, which is, this is one of my paintings where I actually have continuous value changes because with paint, I can actually uh, blend paint, with, particularly with oil paints, because it dries so, so I can blend one thing into another and actually have a continuous change rather than something where I just have a, num a limited number of values uh, that I showed you here with the, with the uh, short drawing pose. And what I'm showing you is that even though I've now added color to it, the guts of this thing is really the value pattern in the edge work. And so now I've basically eliminated the color, and you can actually see the value pattern. You can see all, everything that I showed you in the, in the black and white drawing, you see in this uh, uh, black and white version of the painting. Uh, for instance, again, on the breast, because it's ball-shaped, I can get uh, essentially the full range of, of the value pattern. You can actually see the cast shadow, or the, turn, or the coarse shadow, the turning edge, the reflected light. And you notice as I go down the figure, even the, the highlight, the, the, even though I can stick with a limited uh, number of values, because my light is placed above the model, uh, as I go down the figure, the highlights are going to get less light and the darks are going to get less dark. And everything is going to essentially go towards the gray because I'm moving further and further away from the light, even though I have the same value pattern of highlight, core shadow, cast shadow, uh, and, and reflected light shadow, and, and the midtones, which are, are the, uh, the tonal midtone range. I have a question. Sure. The hair looks like there's no shadow at all on it. There is. You actually can see it here. It's, it's, gray, it's grayish white hair, but actually there is a, the highlight is right here. Basically the light is coming from this direction. If you look at this value, okay. this is much lighter than that. But she has white hair, so I can't make it, I, yeah. it won't be black. And again, her head is closest to the light source. That's the other reason. As I get further and further away from the light source, you look at the highlight down here, it's nowhere near as, as, as intense as the lights in her hair or her breast or on her knee. So okay. as I move further and further... So it's coming from the top, not really right. almost from the top. Correct. Okay. It's basically the light source is out here someplace. Okay. All right. And as I get further and further away from the light source, of course, the highlights get less intense, and the darks get less dark, okay? I mean, you, you need, for, to have dark, you need light. I mean, that's, that's the, and again, it's, you can see this works, 90% of this painting is in the value, the drawing of the edges and the value. The other 10% is in the color, even though I've used an impressionist color, color theme here, where I've used uh, reds. Uh, and, and greens, and it adds another layer to the painting, but I could have gotten away with just this in terms of creating dimensionality. And that's what value and, and edges do in drawing. And I, you know, that's when we're going to cover edges next week. But, you know, these are, this is the way you create dimensionality on a, on a two-dimensional surface of paper. Okay, Nick, cut it.